chapter five of lady jim of curzon street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lady jim of curzon street by fergus hume chapter five a congregation drawn to the church of all angels by various inducements filled it to overflowing the next morning some came because it was christmas day others to hear lionel kames preach many desired to see the ducal party and one or two presented themselves in god's house to thank him for the gift of his son sent to save a dying world knowing the duke's old age impeccability nearly all his guests were present and filled three large pews to the wondering awe of the villagers and their wives these last especially were distracted by the splendour of the ladies dresses and the variety of the new fashions many laudable imitations of those marvellous frocks were visible in country lane and village street before easter lady jim and her husband discreetly sat in the body of the church some distance from the pulpit as leah did not wish to come under the curate's eye she thought he was quite capable of preaching at her in which case a natural resentment would have led to a quarrel prejudicial to the exercise of lionel's good offices with the duke moreover leah occupied with her own thoughts did not want to be distracted by a sermon of religious platitudes she stood up and sat down mechanically looking too flamboyant to be in harmony with the simplicity of the building tucked into the opening of her incroyable coat claret coloured and with strikingly large buttons she wore a cup-shaped nosegay of white and pink orchids her hat was large with many feathers of the new titian red and resembled nothing in nature she did not wear jewellery but the vivid colours of her dress made up for the absence of gems there was something tropical about leah and in that chill grey church she glowed like a gorgeous flower all splendour and perfume and radiant vitality her exuberant beauty and colour attracted even the attention of jim he bent forward when the prayer for the king's majesty was being said i believe you're enjoyin it muttered jim resentfully hush breathed leah devoutly and knelt in a saintly attitude which was far from expressing her real feelings for the moment she did not pray herself or think of the prayer that was being offered her thoughts were busy with bills and duns and jim's defects and the chances that demetrius might prove useful and when she did murmur a prayer it was one of those which are rarely answered or if answered turned to the confusion of the suppliant plenty of money no trouble much enjoyment and the destruction of her enemies were the elements which composed this remarkable petition lady jim was not very clear as to whom she was asking but she had a vague feeling which she mistook for religion that there might be some one who could give her what she required moreover it was just as well to be on the safe side yet even as she tried the experiment the earthly superstition asserted itself and she carefully fingered a peacock's feather inside her muff this serving of god and a fetish may seem ridiculous in a woman of leah's capacity nevertheless she devoutly believed that if the unseen deity did not help her the seen baal would and after all was there not a cat of hind's acquaintance who made genuflections before a pink ribboned flageolet but cats as the poet remarks are so superstitious and leah the pantheress was of the feline tribe having made herself safe with the unknown lady jim joined in the ensuing hymn bravely she thought the words dreary and the tune barbarous but the fervour of her deep contralto voice reached the duke's ears and he gave her an approving glance so that was something gained leah would have gone through the whole collection of ancient and modern to learn the precise meaning of that look but she was satisfied with guessing and sat down cheerfully to be bored with the sermon it occurred to her that the prayer had been heard and would probably be granted but whether by the peacock's feather or the deity of whom lionel now began to speak she could not determine 
and his name shall be called wonderful this was the curate's text and he discoursed on it in a simple and impressive way speaking of the birth of christ of his teaching and plan of salvation of his self-denying life and unwearying kindness the young man's grave and tender periods shamed the most inattentive into thoughtfulness lionel was not a born orator but he was very much in earnest and preached with an emphasis which carried undeniable conviction mrs penworthy felt suddenly virtuous and resolved to repeat as much of the sermon as she could remember to freddy so that he might not grumble so much over what the silly thing called her extravagance even lady canvey wagged her aged head and thought that she might help a few deserving paupers if their needs could be supplied in moderation leah herself was impressed to the extent of hoping that the duke would see that it behooved him to fill the empty pockets of a deserving and pretty daughter-in-law jim would have approved of this sentiment but all the time he was fast asleep and woke up cross when she pinched him to rise for the doxology beyond a stray sentence here and there leah had not paid much attention she had heard it all before though some of the sentiments were new and as she thought ridiculous when the preacher was fairly started she relapsed into her own thoughts these being unpleasant she permitted her hard eyes to wander round the church after a wondering gaze at the extraordinary fashions of the women and a patronizing examination of the decorations she caught sight of a face belonging to a young man on the other side of the aisle he was so like jim that she involuntarily turned to see if her husband still slumbered placidly by her side the double was dressed in grey tweeds and looked almost like a gentleman he stooped a trifle in spite of his square shoulders and stalwart figure and every now and then coughed painfully apparently he was ill with some pulmonary complaint which the freezing atmosphere of the church accentuated leah wondered at the resemblance and thought of certain traditionary stories concerning the youthful days of the duke but after a second glance she decided that perhaps there was nothing in it jim was of a pink and white bovine commonplace type and there were hundreds like him in manners and morals and looks moreover she was so weary of seeing jim's inane face over the breakfast cups that she did not care to gaze at the imitation nevertheless being a woman with the orthodox share of eve's curiosity she resolved to ask questions about this consumptive double mrs arthur the firmingham housekeeper could doubtless tell some story as she knew much more about the duke than had ever appeared even in the most scurrilous society paper and lady jim knew how to make her talk when the plate circled leah quadrupled jim's half-crown and he did not approve when the piece of gold jingled amongst the silver you've been borrowing jim accused her in an angry whisper praise god from whom all blessings flow sang leah without replying and put her whole heart and voice into the hymn in the hope that some of the blessings might trickle her way and why not seeing that she had baited her hook with a sprat to catch the much-needed mackerel but it was useless to explain this to jim he would not have understood such lavish fishing it was really too lovely mrs penworthy assured the duke at luncheon mr kaimes spoke just the things i feel and the decorations oh really so very tasteful but the mistletoe duke i don't think there should have been mistletoe round the pulpit such an immoral plant chimed in lady canvey with sharp twinkling eyes and so useless to some people who can dispense with it as an excuse i dare say the druids were no better than they should have been they were before my time said mrs penworthy very prettily and you must have been quite a child then dear lady canvey the sermon affected lady frith in another fashion oh dear bunny she said to her saturnine husband what a lovely way lionel puts things do let us help people there's leah you know exactly assented frith dryly i do know and for that reason i don't intend to waste money in that direction but lionel talked of aiding the poor and needy that doesn't include the extravagant and ungrateful retorted her lord you are an unsophisticated child hilda 
oh bunny how could you call poor leah and her husband names we must love every one at this season oh i'll love them as much as you please but not to the extent of supporting them plainly there was nothing to be got out of frith as lady jim decided when the marchioness reported a part of this conversation later in the day but she attempted to soften the marquis by saying things which she knew the child wife would babble again to her hard-hearted husband jim and i don't want money dear she said kissing lady frith so long as frith is nice to us we don't care you have your position to keep up and we are nothing but it was sweet of you to speak oh no prattled hilda in her childish way i want every one to love me ever so much i am sure they do isn't frith jealous as nearly jealous as a perfect man can be i thought perfect men had no imperfection retorted lady jim ironically but it's all right dear another kiss we must bear our cross as lionel said this morning now i must go to see old mrs arthur one must be good to one's inferiors the result of this conversation was that lady frith told her husband of leah's pointedly correct humbleness whereat the marquis laughed shortly he quite understood lady jim's tactics and was resolved that they should not succeed frith was one of the few men lady jim had never fascinated and she hated to be under his clear-sighted gaze if hilda could have heard leah's inward remarks as she proceeded to the housekeeper's room she would scarcely have given so favourable a report good day mrs arthur said lady jim to the old-fashioned dame in this black silk and lace cap who rose to drop a prim curtsey i have come to wish you the compliments of the season thank you my lady won't you be seated lady jim selected the most comfortable chair in the quaint small room and graciously requested the housekeeper to resume her seat then she asked about mrs arthur's cough and her sailor son and her married daughter and after various other things in which she did not feel the least interest the old woman much impressed with leah's condescension and not sufficiently clever to see through her arts expanded like a winter rose in this aristocratic sunshine in a few minutes she was chatting quite at her ease and with the discursive garrulousness of old age this was the unguarded mood leah desired for the satisfaction of her curiosity and having created it by an appearance of the deepest interest in mrs arthur's domestic small beer chronicles she proceeded to take advantage of the opportunity the service was delightful this morning she observed the decorations were charming and the congregation so attentive i suppose you know every one in the village mrs arthur i ought to my lady i am firmingham bred and born and a very good representative of the place said leah kindly the villagers are really quite nice looking especially the men if you saw my son was he in church this morning asked lady jim who knew very well that the young man was with his ship in chinese waters i saw rather a handsome young fellow in one of the pews but he looked ill of course i thought him handsome she went on carelessly and with a soft laugh he was the image of my husband mrs arthur looked rather nervous there is only one young man hereabouts who resembles lord james she observed and i do not wonder you saw the likeness my lady harold garth is like lord james now and is such as his grace was in his youth oh leah's eyes opened do you mean to say nothing my lady nothing and mrs arthur's hands fiddled nervously with the gold chain she wore round her neck then woman-like she went on to contradict herself harold garth has lately returned from canada where he went to farm garth i seem to know the name i don't know who can have mentioned it to you my lady he is the only garth in the district and i dare say you never saw him before well no i must admit that i never have why canada exclaimed mrs arthur vaguely he has been there for the last twenty years he went out to make money at the age of fifteen and has apparently returned with consumption yes poor lad but the duke is very kind to him lady jim laughed meaningly oh the duke is very kind to him is he that's so like the duke always thoughtful fifteen and twenty he is about thirty-five more or less my lady my husband's age said lady jim pointedly yes my lady assented mrs arthur closing her lips firmly 
leah tried another question why doesn't this young man's family keep him instead of letting the duke support him harold garth has no family my lady his mother is dead and his father mrs arthur looked down i know nothing about his father she said in low tones harold is a lonely man poor soul he lives at the pentland arms and mrs kibby the landlady is as kind to him as though he were her own son and his grace bless him does all he can to smooth harold's way to the grave he sent that foreign doctor to demetrius said lady jim quickly oh so demetrius knows him yes my lady he thinks he can cure him of this consumption i do not think so myself proceeded mrs arthur garrulously for harold is booked for death you can see it in his face i believe his grace wants him to go to a warmer climate what a deep interest the duke takes in this man mrs arthur looked up suddenly and a flush dyed her withered cheek the eyes of the two women met and the situation was adjusted without words after that interchange of glances leah knew as well as if mrs arthur had explained at length that harold had ducal blood in his veins and that is why he is so like jim she thought rising to go i hope the poor fellow will get well she said aloud but really he was foolish to venture into that cold church i don't think he minds if he is dead or alive my lady he has no friends oh yes the duke certainly his grace who is a friend to all said mrs arthur loyally lady jim laughed and went away she had learned all she wished to learn but beyond satisfying a passing curiosity had no desire to pursue the subject still she thought it would amuse her to ask demetrius a few questions concerning this patient and went in search of him somehow the subject of harold garth and his resemblance to jim took hold of her imagination and she could not put it out of her head while she was thinking of other matters the thought of the strange likeness now fully accounted for would slip in and she would find herself pondering afterwards she declared that this insistence upon a passing thought was the work of providence for so she called the peacock feather bale she served demetrius was not in the house having been called out to see some one who was ill in the village so lionel assured her and moreover supplied her with the name of the patient it's a young fellow called harold garth he said gravely he foolishly came to church this morning and being already ill is worse from having ventured out i never heard a parson call going to church foolishness before said lady jim surprised that the subject should crop up again in so unexpected a manner who is harold garth a protege of the duke's he has just returned from canada said the curate simply and curiously enough he is rather like the kames family perhaps that is why the duke is so kind to him perhaps it is said leah wondering how much lionel guessed i don't think i ever saw him she added mendaciously if you did you would mistake him for your husband how awful shuddered leah as though one jim wasn't enough to be bothered with but can't we talk of something more interesting your sermon for instance i trust you found that interesting said lionel smiling oh yes it wasn't too long i see dryly you judge the interest of a sermon by its length oh no really i quite enjoyed your preaching i don't preach that people may enjoy but that they may think seriously of what they are i'm sure i think seriously enough lionel have you spoken to the duke no i wish you would to-morrow this is christmas day remember as if i could forget with all the nonsense that's going on here retorted lady jim glancing superciliously round at the decorations every one is overdoing the brotherly business i quite expected my maid to tell me that she loved me and i don't see why you shouldn't ask the duke to-day you'll squeeze the money out of him the more easily while he's got this christmassy emotion on i don't squeeze money out of people said kames stiffly what a large income you must have then i live within it that's nothing to boast of i'd live within mine if i had ten thousand a year i doubt it replied lionel who could not help laughing at her coolness you'd spend fifty thousand if you had it rather if i were the duchess of pentland but there's no chance of such luck frith's too healthy do smile again lionel you've got such nice teeth and look quite a good sort when you let yourself go 
what am i to smile at asked the curate with deliberate austerity at me and on me i put ten shillings into the plate this morning lionel was a thoroughly good young man and had a great sense of the dignity of his cloth and the responsibility of his position but he also possessed humour and could not help retorting after the style of a certain witty bishop that's the smallest fire insurance i ever heard of said he genially and moved away leaving lady jim amused i didn't think he had so much fun in him she thought making for the library but the speech is too clever to be original which showed that leah suspected the existence of the witty bishop but the word insurance put her mind on jim's mad idea to pretend death and cheat the company out of twenty thousand pounds with accumulations leah devoutly wished that the trick could be managed its success meant a clearance of debt and of jim when the millennium would come and as mrs nickleby's admirer put it all would be gas and gaiters she resolved to have another chat with jim on the subject and meantime went to seek for a novel after boring herself with mrs arthur and lionel she wished to read away a well-earned hour of peace but this for the moment she was not destined to enjoy the library was empty save for the presence of the last person whom lady jim wished to encounter when miss jaffrey looked up from a gigantic volume with an almost toothless smile leah turned to fly but the old maid arrested her flight with a joyful shout she usually did shout as her brother was slightly deaf which deceived her into thinking the entire human race was likewise afflicted so sweet of you to come here shouted miss jaffrey i am just dying for someone to talk to if the decision had been left to lady jim she would have gladly avoided the talk to bring about this result but it occurred to her scheming mind that this dull spinster was wealthy and might be cajoled or frightened into lending money leah did not specify the sum even in her own mind as she did not know how much more this virgin soil would yield if properly worked sitting down promptly she began to chat on the first subject that came into her head what are you reading so earnestly she asked sweetly the mort d'artour said the spinster fondling the ponderous tome which her weak knees could hardly support heavens thought lady jim with a charming smile meaning nothing am i to be bored with another arthur the black letter edition went on miss jaffrey in a loud and oratorical voice most interesting so sweet to think of those dear dead days when knights went about as troubadours with guitars and steel armour dying for queens of beauty delightful assented lady jim yawning at the dullness of the picture but with a disparaging glance at the lettering isn't it rather like reading a german newspaper i prefer novels myself so do i when not in a poetic humour shouted her companion all the old old masters of fiction dickens bulwer lytton wilkie collins i love them all every one i seem to know those names ventured leah carefully what did they write miss jaffrey the spinster gasped brought up in a library she could not understand this fashionable ignorance which truth to say was partially assumed leah was by no means the ignoramus she made herself out to be but for the sake of business she thought it judicious to foster miss jaffrey's vanity by assuming an inferior position do you ever read asked miss jaffrey in the voice of goliath challenging the army of saul oh yes society newspapers and french novels but they are so improper nothing amusing is improper to my mind said lady jim calmly and i really did skim through a page or two of dickens horribly dull i thought him oh miss jaffrey gasped again he did so much good perhaps that is why his books are dull thoroughly good people are invariably here she discreetly pulled the reins as miss jaffrey considering herself good might not relish the malicious witticism presuming she could understand it i'll take you as my instructor dear miss jaffrey added leah stifling another yawn do tell me what to read there's wilkie collins's armadale said the old man delighted at being put into the pulpit but you might think me rude for recommending that why should i 
there's a character in it so like you in appearance apologized miss jaffrey in appearance only you will understand i should be sorry indeed to think that in morals you resembled miss gwilt miss how much gwilt g w i l t spelt the spinster the strange name of a strange woman she's the character i spoke of no really you mightn't like her she was well er er disreputable better begin with the woman in white oh i've heard of that what is it about a striking resemblance between two women one is passed off by her wicked husband as the other and buried to get money you understand a kind of fraud leah turned cold and hot it sounded as though this simple woman was explaining the contemplated deceit of herself and jim i don't think i should like that book at all she said diplomatically cunning it sounds dull i would rather read about the naughty woman miss what's her name it's in yonder bookshelf said miss jaffrey pointing a lean finger to the end of the room along with the rest of the master's novels but please don't think i fancy you resemble miss gwilt's moral character you certainly have her auburn hair red hair corrected lady jim rising i'm rather proud of it you ought to be said the old maid with simple admiration and rising to put away her tome i can imagine you a queen of beauty in the dear old tournaments with knights at your feet oh many are there now without tournaments said leah with superb self-confidence but i prefer men of higher rank than knights though i will say she added generously that men who have won knighthood are cleverer than those donkeys who inherit all this was greek to miss jaffrey and after putting away her volume she departed with a final recommendation about miss gwilt lady jim walked to where wilkie collins's novels lined the shelf and needless to say selected the woman in white i wonder if i can make fact out of fiction she asked herself End of chapter five chapter six of lady jim of curzon street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lady jim of curzon street by fergus hume chapter six it was jim's custom to saunter into his wife's bedroom before descending to make a hearty meal and complain that he had rested badly this was a pleasing fiction as he slept like a dormouse and snored steadily through the hours he allotted to sleep without even a dream but on entering for his morning grumble he was so surprised to find leah in her dressing-gown before a brisk fire with a breakfast at her elbow and a book open on her lap that he forgot his egotism jim could scarcely believe his lazy eyes for he knew well that leah was no student what's up he asked after pausing at the door to say by jupiter with every appearance of surprise got a headache if i had should i cure it with a novel asked his wife disdainfully don't know i'm sure replied jim with the matutinal good humour of a healthy animal doctors recommend such rum things nowadays but it doesn't matter i'm off to feed wait for ten minutes jim i have something to say you're not goin to read are you i can't stand readin on an empty stum well on nothin have you ever heard of the woman in white asked leah irrelevantly no who is she it's a novel don't read em real life's much more fun lady jim looked at him steadily we might turn this she touched the book lightly into real life going to make a play of it questioned jim obtusely well you might call it a comedy she answered i certainly do not want it to be a tragedy though it might come to that she ended in a lower tone jim opened his puzzled blue eyes want of breakfast i suppose he ruminated but i don't know what you're talking about i've passed a white night announced his wife abruptly what's that the french expression for a wakeful night 
but you say it in english and how can it's useless wasting french on a man who understands only the argot of the trottoir you're wasting it now a wakeful night eh why didn't you try that new sedative demetrius gave you i didn't want to sleep this book was too interesting i wish you to read it and she extended the novel to her husband what if she had offered poison jim could not have betrayed more abhorrence read you want me to read well you know words of two syllables don't you she retorted impatiently take it jim handled the book as though it were a scorpion turning over a hundred leaves rapidly love and diaries and old oh, bosh not at all unless bosh is your word for common sense i see a chance of getting that money what money leah made an impatient movement how dense you are the insurance money of course the twenty thousand pounds suppose you died stop it i told you i wouldn't and you told me that you might pretend to die oh i was only talking you don't want me to be buried alive it wouldn't be much good said his wife with a shrug we must have a genuine corpse like you an inkling of her meaning stole into jim's dull brain and he sat down suddenly go on said he hoarsely harold garth is like you where the what the you saw him in church yesterday he's ill with consumption dying they say demetrius attends him supposing supposing her imagination made her cheeks flush supposing oh you understand the sluggish comprehension of the man grasped her hinted scheme suddenly and his eyes lighted up supposing he died and was buried in place of me you mean you don't suppose i mean murder do you she cried rising to the height of her tall figure and speaking irritably you would if there was money in it said jim grimly it would be a natural death went on leah rapidly and pacing the room to relieve the strain on her nerves the poor fellow can't live long if he died and was buried as no go contradicted jim rising in his turn every one about here knows of the likeness for which he added slowly there's a reason so i learned yesterday from mrs arthur jim was indignant do you mean to tell me i mean to tell you that i gathered the truth from what she left unsaid you don't suppose that i require words to explain things i don't see how it's to be managed said kames reflectively if it could be would you surrender everything and yes i would for a quarter of the money then i'd go out of your life and to lima lima said lady jim stopping suddenly why to lima you've been there three times since we married no end of a place lima muttered jim feebly his wife looked at his colouring face attentively and laughed in a short rasping manner an idea had occurred to her which she did not think it necessary to impart to jim when you're legally dead she said sharply i shall have no control over your life or movements all i want to know is if this business can be managed will you do your share by disappearing yes but i don't see how read that book jim and you'll understand better it gave me the idea though our plot will be different in many ways well said jim tucking the novel under his arm i'll dip into it don't let any one see you reading and replace it in the library without any one knowing why should i you fool snarled leah viciously if this thing is to be carried through safely no suspicion must rest on either of us do you suppose that i have spoken to this double of yours or have let any one know that i have read the book i don't think it really matters much as people are too stupid to see things but it is just as well to be on the safe side but i don't see how began kames again and again she cut him short i do i do 
demetrius attends this young fellow oh and he demetrius i mean leave me to deal with him she said confidently jim flung the book on the floor and looked at her with clenched hands what is this demetrius to you he asked violently a puppet i can pull the strings of she retorted and be good enough to remember that you are not in a training stable if that beastly little tartar my dear jim said his wife coolly if you ask me about demetrius i shall certainly ask you about lima kames was taken aback lima he stammered flushing to the roots of his fair hair what do you mean i mean that you can trust me to ask no questions if you will mind your own business as you are my wife demetrius is my business think of me as your widow then she mocked and that i can't be without the aid of demetrius why can't you speak plainly i might ask you the same question but she picked up the novel and thrust it into jim's unwilling hands i fancy you and i understand one another pretty well i won't have any man making love to you very good said leah calmly then you must remain a pauper and my husband i'm not going to all this trouble to share you with well with whom out with it i think you can answer that question best jim upon my honour paw she said with disgust hadn't we better leave honour out of this shady business we are about to embark in you really mean to i really mean to get that twenty thousand pounds you'll lose me jim reminded her uneasily leah made a grimace my loss is another's gain she said significantly now go away jim i have to dress in my best frock in order to fascinate demetrius and she vanished into her dressing room with a provoking laugh lord jim said something about demetrius that involved the use of unprintable language then he slipped the book into the pocket of his shooting jacket and lumbered downstairs in spite of his squabbling with leah and the existence of some one in lima he was furiously jealous of demetrius and scowled at the russian when they met demetrius rather liked that scowl as he guessed the reason and took it as a tribute to his fascinations if he had known lady jim's real intentions and that she intended to convert english rather than french fiction into everyday facts he might not have smiled so victoriously over his coffee but demetrius made the fatal mistake of so many clever men he knew he was clever and thereby was not what he fancied himself to be the true secret of success lies not in knowing how clever one's self is but how stupid other people are while jim was growling over his provender miss tallentire who had finished her breakfast slipped out of the room she felt strange in the company of the frumps and fashionables which formed the house-party certainly the frumps were eating in private and would not appear till the world was well aired and they had been made up sufficiently well to prevent the younger generation being shocked but the fashionable people came to breakfast in public and joan found the talk far above her comprehension these languid creatures who ate so little and talked so much were like inhabitants of a strange planet and it was with great relief that the girl found herself passed over of course nobody thought of noticing cinderella in her rags as lady canvey was being rehabilitated by a skilful maid and would not be seen as the world knew her for at least two hours joan had this time to herself the brightness of the day tempted her to assume hat and jacket for a morning walk and she was shortly tripping over the crisp snow of the avenue the glorious sunshine the keen air the dazzling whiteness of the snow and the generally invigorating influence of this ideal winter morning stirred the current of her blood to nimbleness joan began to sing softly and could hardly keep from dancing so rapidly did her spirits mount skyward 
at length the place being solitary and she being recklessly young a sudden impulse sent her flying like an arrow between the grim firs near the gates she shot directly into the arms of a man and uttered an ejaculation this was hardly to be wondered at seeing that the arms closed tightly round her and a pair of warm lips deepened the colour which exercise had brought to her cheeks lionel cried joan and darling replied lionel which sufficiently explains the feeling which existed between lady canvey's companion and lady canvey's pet these two babies as the old lady called them had been engaged for six months but the fact was not generally known the clerical parent of joan had given his consent on the understanding that lionel was to possess a better income and the best vicarage obtainable before he made joan mrs kaimes the young man had agreed readily enough as he did not want to inflict his comparative penury and poor lodgings on the girl he so dearly loved joan and he had decided to wait for two years and during that time lionel was to reform lambeth he was attempting to do this with all the vigour of his energetic nature and between times made love to joan lady canvey knew of the engagement and would have had the couple married at once since she could easily have given lionel a living and wished to do so but the curate was anxious to become the vicar of firmingham the present incumbent was seriously ill and in the event of death the duke had promised that lionel should fill the pulpit therefore the lovers waited very happily and if firmingham did not come to them within the decreed two years they were quite prepared to marry on the bread and cheese of a hard london life meantime joan was seeing a trifle of west end life under lady canvey's wing and her earnings as lady canvey's companion were most acceptable to the hard-worked mr tallentire and his wife thus it was that joan returned lionel's kiss and only released herself from his loving arms when she remembered they were within sight of the lodge lionel how can you she said setting her hat straight how can't i you mean he replied smiling do you think i am as cold as the snow i don't know if you're as nice pouted joan or you would have asked me to walk with you this morning no dear he said gravely i could not have taken you to see harold garth the poor fellow is too ill but we can walk now i have nothing to do and joan where are you going back to the house i won't be taken for a walk on nothing to do terms you silly child you cruel boy then they kissed and made it up in full view of a red breast who cocked his head on one side and wondered why these human beings looked so pleased joan said shoo and he flew away to tell his wife while the couple walked sedately through the gates and into a world which their love created for themselves alone all the same their conversation was a trifle prosaic they read a letter which joan had received from her mother about trouble over the christmas gifts to the poor of the parish and discussed this old woman who lived in a chilly garret and that old man who dwelt like a troglodyte in a damp cellar till the conversation became as sober as the looks of the village sexton whom they met and he was a teetotaler but however enthusiastic human nature may be in the talking and doing of good works love after all takes precedence of philanthropy and shortly they began discussing themselves and their happiness what they said does not matter much although foolish it was sweet to them and joan's eyes sparkled like the icicles on the bleak hedgerows at the looks her lover gave her they walked in the pleasant land of tenderness and down the by-lane of first love joan had never seen the old french chart of that country with its quaint names and odd geography but neither lionel nor herself needed its guidance they had skimmed through the country before and knew the lie of it extremely well the pair soared pretty nearly to the gates of their transcendental heaven until the strain became too great for mere human effort and they folded their wings of thought to drop earthward that unfailing timepiece the human interior announced the hour of luncheon and with some haste they turned homeward 
i am hungry said lionel ogreishly don't eat me laughed miss tallentire you look as though you could you be red riding hood and i the wolf suggested lionel no do be serious lionel i want you to tell me about this poor man you saw garth ah he'll never see another christmas consumption is wasting him to a shadow in another three or four months lionel broke off with a sigh poor man can't anything be done asked joan sympathetically everything possible is being done joan the duke is looking after garth in every way you know how kind he is he even sent demetrius to cure him and if demetrius can't no one else can but if he was taken to a warmer climate the end would only be retarded for a few months interrupted the curate demetrius says there is no hope and i don't think the poor fellow is sorry to go joan he has no relatives and few friends i fancy he has had a lonely life the tears filled joan's brown eyes poor fellow she echoed stealing one hand into that of her lover's fancy if we i can't fancy it with you by my side and what is more i don't intend to fancy it said lionel hastily please god you and i have many happy and useful years before us how do you like the firmingham vicarage joan oh it's lovely and such a sweet church but i fear it's too good to be true perhaps it's not what you want joked the curate if i were the duke now ah that's impossible she laughed amused at the idea of being a duchess the very idea frightens me it needn't lionel assured her you will never be called upon to wear strawberry leaves unless the duke and firth and jim all go the way poor garth is taking and then frith's wife may have a little lord firmingham i sincerely hope so as it would never do for jim to be the duke of pentland you don't like him not passionately said the curate dryly his wife would make a splendid duchess in looks i have no doubt but with fifty thousand a year and a great position she and jim would do good to neither god nor man lady james came seems very kind observed joan timidly it's all seeming of real true self-sacrificing kindness she knows absolutely nothing but she is so beautiful lionel so was jezebel i expect oh lionel oh joan he mimicked don't worry your head over lady jim she will always get on well in this world though i am very doubtful about her position in the next come he pointed down the incline of the lane i'll race you to the bottom we might meet some one i don't care i'm out for a holiday and away flew lionel down the snowy lane with his clerical coat-tails fluttering in the wind joan girlish and simple and extremely young sped after him and with rosy cheeks arrived at the goal before her lover come said the curate wiping his heated brow considering i won three flat races at the varsity that's not bad joan you humbug as if i didn't see that you let me win i'll be a tyrant after marriage said lionel merrily enjoy your little day my love i am enjoying this day said joan as they walked rapidly towards the park gates but what will lady canby say pooh what does it matter she was young herself a century ago she's a dear old woman no contradicted lionel critically she is old and clever but i should not call her a dear the word suits some one else me cried joan triumphantly how clever of you to guess that hullo who is this the gates were opened and a sledge issued drawn by two black ponies in it sat lady jim who was driving and dr constantine demetrius what is she up to now lionel asked himself he was intensely distrustful of lady jim but he did not explain this to joan End of chapter six chapter seven of lady jim of curzon street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
lady jim of curzon street by fergus hume chapter seven the sledge occupied by this well-matched couple might have been used by pompadour in the days when the finances of france were melting in the furnace of versailles the basket-work body of a swan gilded and painted and elegantly fragile rested delicately on slim steel runners and glided over the frozen snow in the rear of two spirited black ponies these harnessed in the russian fashion with a paucity of trappings and many tiny silver bells sprang forward under lady jim's skilful guidance as though they were rioting in a spring meadow she and her companion were snugly wrapped in an opossum rug which leah rather vulgarly despised as a cheap article her mink cloak with the snowy ermine scarf drawn through the shoulder cape in the latest fashion had cost nearly ten times the amount and leah wore it with the proud consciousness that she owed no money for it it was an early winter present from lady frith and she had accepted it on the generous ground that its cut and rich brown colour became her better than they would have suited the dowdy insignificant marchioness but the little woman never knew that lady jim's good nature had prevailed to this extent she had thought to give leah pleasure demetrius muffled in muscovite sable sat contentedly by this tauric diana wondering why he had been graciously invited to drive with the goddess after a hurried luncheon the two were tete-a-tete for the groom had been dispensed with as out of keeping with the novel vehicle the excuse was artistic nevertheless demetrius suspected other reasons for the absence of an eavesdropping servant what these might be he hoped to hear from lady jim but as yet she showed no disposition to speak frankly for the russian in jim's picturesque speech was a gentleman to be handled with the gloves on jim himself had impressed this on leah before he sat down to spell out the woman in white needless to say this unusual effort to improve what jim was pleased to term his mind bored him extremely not a word about racin grumbled jim skipping page after page still as leah pointed out the necessity of poaching on the domain of fiction jim sat at his lesson like a good little boy and his wife drove out with her proposed victim that the irony of fate might change the victim into a possible tyrant did not occur to leah at that moment all the same she was careful not to commit herself too hastily and for two miles talked society journal paragraphs with an assiduity at once boring and perplexing to demetrius even when the sledge slipped silent and ghost-like over an arctic waste and they were alone to babble secrets to a frosty sky leo showed no disposition to come to the point she wished demetrius to question her and then by seeing into his mind she could be guided as to the most selfishly successful way of making up her own but the doctor guessed her reason for this diplomatic silence and knowing what a shameless capacity she had for word twisting and for slipping out of untenable positions he gave her no opportunity to overlook his hand it was certainly as he reflected a game of skill but what the precise style of game might be demetrius could not guess however one thing was certain this game like all others was being played for money on lady jim's part that is demetrius shuffled his cards for the stake of love and so having leah kames for an antagonist lost at the outset a game between a man and a woman on amatory grounds is always unequal the one in earnest invariably loses does this remind you of the steppes asked leah waving her whip towards a desert of snow and ice the polite conversation was still much in evidence somewhat madame but i cannot remember sledging across any steppe in such charming company 
ah you have never driven mademoiselle aksakoff then it is a pleasure yet to come in russia why not she may induce her father to make my peace with the czar you would be pleased demetrius shrugged his spare shoulders and replied in the evasive manner which characterized this conversation on the part of both i am well content with england he remarked calmly many people are pleasant and all agreeable also the duke pays me well too well considering he is my solitary patient i never knew a physician to quarrel with his fees before laughed lady jim flicking the ponies lightly and you have another patient i understand mr kaimes said something about it the young priest ah yes he was at the gates with that most adorable young lady whom i presume he will marry your anglican priests like our greek popes have that freedom have they not you do not answer my question ah pardon madame said the doctor with an apologetic smile and his hands palm to palm yes it is so i have another patient a peasant one harold garth he pronounced the name uncommonly clearly how well you speak english monsieur demetrius so many foreigners over-emphasize their h's and slur their r's we russians have a capacity for tongues i know five languages can you tell the truth in any one of them asked lady jim rather rudely but then she wished to make him lose his temper in the hope of breaking down his reserve but love had not yet blinded demetrius and he became offensively gentle to you madame i always speak the truth i take you at your word said lady jim smartly why did you leave russia monsieur demetrius madame i come of a princely family but for the sake of humanity i practise my profession in moscow a dear friend of mine foolishly joined the anarchists and an order was issued for his arrest fortunately the official who signed the warrant was my patient and i chanced to be with him when the paper was brought for his signature he laid it aside for the moment and i saw my friend's name i therefore gave my patient a drug which made him sleep for twenty-four hours so that he could not sign meanwhile my friend escaped it matters not how but he escaped with my help through a rival doctor my use of the drug to aid my friend became known and i was accused of conspiring also the governor of moscow was enraged and ordered my arrest in my friend's place the prospect of siberia was not pleasant so i crossed the frontier after many delightful adventures with the recital of which i shall not trouble you behold me therefore in your free country madame no longer a subject of the czar but your devoted slave he told the story without preamble or excuse in an unemotional and level voice though all the time he wondered why lady jim desired to hear it she gave him no explanation and if you go back to russia she asked carelessly i fear i shall never go back madame who knows mademoiselle aksakoff might precisely madam she might and with small encouragement she would but her gaining of my pardon would assuredly lead to a marriage of gratitude that would be no sacrifice to many no to myself madam it is impossible can you not make your peace without her influence alas no madame the grand duke was furious at my share in my friend's escape he would give much to capture me and should i set foot on the continent he shrugged his shoulders significantly but the third section has no power in your land of liberty the third section if it pleases madame better the secret police no unless i marry mademoiselle aksakoff of whom i admit my unworthiness i must remain in exile but it has many compensations he added bowing his head courteously to lady jim's profile quite so she assented scarcely heeding the compliment then added thoughtfully you are a daring man monsieur demetrius daring when necessary madame but i confess to a love of ease 
leah swung her ponies round a curve with careless dexterity it is not probable that any one will invite you to leave your lotus-eating monsieur thank you for the story it is at your service madame lady jim hesitated you do not ask me why i requested you to relate it she said at last your wish is a command a command is never questioned i might wish you to do something that you might question ah no believe me don't jump in the dark said leah with a hard little laugh by the way this woman for whom you ventured so much it was a man madame david and jonathan in crim tartary i suppose they say she gave a conscious laugh that a man would venture farther for a woman than for one of his own sex you i resume are an exception madame one does some things for friendship but all things for love leah glanced at the pale face beside her with a smile and saw that the dark eyes were full of fire you are romantic as is every man when he loves madame i understand mademoiselle aksakoff you penetrate my thoughts admirably lady jim relieved her feelings by using the whip on the obedient ponies demetrius was clever and suspicious also as his story assured her he was daring clear-headed and might be dangerous if she gave this man a hold over her he might be and probably would be unscrupulous enough to use his power moreover lionel had not yet asked the duke and there was always the chance that the money could be obtained without the necessity of plotting leah had taken the doctor for this delightful drive with the intention of speaking plainly but his skilful use of words made her cautious she was too clever a woman to build her tower without reckoning the expense demetrius watched her with keen questioning eyes and a perfectly impassive face but he learned nothing lady jim was quite as oriental as himself in masking her emotions nevertheless he guessed that the interest displayed in his past involved more than the satisfying of an idle curiosity she wanted money he was certain of that but unless she intended to sell him to the third section he could not conceive why she had forced his confidence the enigma irritated him though he paid a silent tribute to the diplomatic powers of this charming englishwoman but cool and cautious as he was her next speech nearly reduced him to the necessity of speaking plainly although he regarded candour as a greater sin than making love to another man's wife now we'll drive home said leah briskly ah but no madame this is charming and chilly i am not a russian to revel in snow and ice madame the fire in our veins prevents our feeling the disagreeables of nature i am no phlegmatic englishman how interesting said leah indifferently i wonder if the cattle will face this snowstorm they were driving straight into a chaos of eddying flakes and meeting the sting of bitter sleet dashed in their blinking eyes by the wind demetrius bit his lips and suppressed his fiery nature with an effort due to years of training he could have killed this woman with her contemptuous indifference and impregnable self-possession as the ponies plunged with tossing heads and jingling bells into that arctic hurricane he wished that the sledge would overturn so that he might extort a word of gratitude by saving her life but leah's courage was as high as his own and her strength greater so it was quite probable that she would be able to look after herself all he could do was to unflinchingly face the volleying snow while lady jim dashed through the hostile elements like semiramis in her war chariot with a turn of her wrist she prevented the frightened ponies dashing into a thorny hedge with another turn swung the light vehicle away from a dangerous ditch and then lashed the animals into a headlong gallop which ended only when they trembled with smoking flanks and drooping heads before the firmingham porch and throughout that furious rocking blinding drive demetrius sat grimly silent 
lady jim was disappointed it would have been more courageous and amusing had he made love to her in the jaws of death quite a russian adventure she said tossing the reins to a groom and jumped out all colour and animation i hope you were not afraid monsieur demetrius she added unjustly for you he replied significantly with a rosy face and a display of white teeth leah faced him on the steps there was no need i assure you i can look after myself in every way i can believe that madam then why talk nonsense to amuse you my good man i don't want amusement but help demetrius started forward impulsively command me lady jim flung her wraps her whip her mink cape and her gloves into his arms thanks she said carelessly and turned towards the library leaving her illegal admirer pale with rage she stopped laughing at the remembrance of his wrath when she saw lionel studying a book near the window well she asked coming lightly towards him any news yes i have seen the duke and he and he her voice died away under stress of emotion he will help you leah's first feeling was one of relief and she was almost on the point of expressing gratitude but a sudden remembrance that aid from the duke meant the retention of jim as a most undesirable husband cooled the warm impulse she recovered her self-command and was about to go into figures when mrs penworthy with a noisy party bustled into the room looking rather tousled and flushed we have been playing hunt the slipper she announced in her high thin voice and algy found mine three times lady jim annoyed at the irruption glanced at mrs penworthy's feet which could scarcely have worn the slippers of cinderella i can quite believe that she said sweetly and left the room smiling what does she mean asked algy obtusely mrs penworthy knew perfectly well what was meant but was too feminine to explain save in a way calculated to mislead her courtier this could be done by arousing his egotism she means that you are clever to play the game so well was her explanation i rather think lady jim admires you algy the youth fondled what he called a moustache rippin woman lady jim said he taking the speech literally go and tell her so snapped mrs penworthy colouring angrily you wouldn't like it nothing would give me greater pleasure remarked the lady fervently hating him for his stupidity than to see her dancing on you as she does on all men who are foolish enough to make themselves carpets i'm not a carpet no you're a tame cat then come and play puss in the corner urged algy gaily and mrs penworthy consented as this game had nothing to do with abnormal slippers leah pleased at having snubbed mrs penworthy whom she considered quite an improper person went to look for jim in his room he was there sure enough lying on the sofa with the novel tossed carelessly on the floor and a black pipe between his lips evidently he had not heard the good news jim cried leah breathlessly the duke will part he has parted growled jim swinging his long legs on to the floor and producing a check look at that lady jim did it was for two hundred pounds oh she crushed it in her two hands as though she were throttling his grace what an insult End of chapter seven chapter eight of lady jim of curzon street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lady jim of curzon street by fergus hume chapter eight two hundred pounds lady jim rapidly ran over in her mind such of the most pressing liabilities as she could recollect and shuddered at a total of two thousand 
they owed that and many other debts which for the moment escaped her memory so far as she could see nothing remained but a compulsory journey through the court not that she really minded bankruptcy plenty of people accepted as immaculate by society made use of that desirable institution to get a receipt for past extravagances on the plea of having lived beyond their incomes she and jim could make the same excuse with perfect truth and would doubtless be enabled to make a fresh start and if a few tradesmen were ruined what did it matter they always overcharged and it might be a lesson to them not to worry customers no the bankruptcy court matters very little but the want of ready cash mattered a great deal leah cared nothing about paying the bills but ardently desired to have a refilled purse and no bother about such vulgar things as pounds shillings and pence it was perfectly idiotic of the duke to be so stingy if he had come down with a thousand she and jim could have enjoyed themselves abroad for a couple of months and meanwhile he could have paid these troublesome tradesmen but two hundred pounds did the old fool take them for the respectable middle-class couple living in slate-roofed houses to which she had alluded without jim's assistance she could get rid of that trifle in a fortnight i believe your father's brain is softening she complained crossly i am not responsible for his crazy arithmetic retorted jim with the helpful addition of a few adjectives but beyond swearing as much as he dared in her presence jim could offer no assistance and leah concluded that after all it might be necessary to trust demetrius her husband having gained some faint idea of the novel had ended in declining to turn fiction into fact his remarks were not without shrewdness the chap who writes the story knows what's goin to happen said jim when pressed for his opinion and can invent circumstances to dodge results but if we start a yarn of this kind on our own we don't know what the end'll be oh yes protested leah very patiently considering she disagreed entirely you'll disappear and i shall become a widow with my share of the twenty thousand and how long will your share last asked jim derisively that depends upon my mood some time i expect seeing that your death will force me into retirement and crape is not so very expensive and when you get through your lot jim what will you do that's what i'm asking you said jim evasively and continued hurriedly lest she should insist upon a disagreeable explanation sides there's my father to be considered since when have you taken him to your heart oh it's all very well talkin but your father's your father when all's said and done the duke doesn't think me a saint but he'd be sorry to see me die no one wants you to die she said impatiently that's bunkum and and what's the word might i suggest sophistry said lady jim quite aware that her reasoning was fallacious oh you'll suggest anything to get your own way but what i mean is that though i do die i don't really die how clearly you put things jim please yourself we must go back to town with this money to be whitewashed and eyeing the cheque contemptuously she saw that it was unfortunately made payable to jim her husband stretched for the cheque and slipped it into his waistcoat pocket i'm going to see the duke myself he announced and tell him everything what about the money we've raised on the income every blessed thing said kames doggedly he's my father and it's his duty to square things he mightn't follow your reasoning murmured leah with one hand on the mantelpiece and the other holding up her skirts to warm one foot but you can't make a much worse mess of it than lionel has made two hundred pounds he must have thought he was asking money for some old woman shall i come with you jim no 
he halted at the door to deliver himself of the remark you're like a red rag to a bull oh very well i only thought you'd like me to translate your talk into something resembling english don't you fret yourself i'll make him understand and if i do get things squared cried jim warming at the thought of his heroism and facing an angry parent you'll have to drop spending money and live as other women do yes dear james and you'll live as other men do won't you i'll do what i jolly well please and why james there never was a saint jim that i ever heard of mused leah turning pensive eyes on her exasperated husband and as you wish to canonize yourself of course you must change your name yes james she moved swiftly towards him and detained him gently by the lapels of his coat from this time forth we'll live in holy matrimony and pig it on what's left of the income curzon street given up bayswater remains and there james darling we'll live a life of extremely plain living and high thinking don't talk bosh growled jim trying to escape but she held on no james i won't if you will only raise my intellect to the level of your own and think what a delightful existence it will be james a cheap bayswater dungeon with three servants and the shopping done at whiteley's i'll turn my dresses and trim my hats and you'll give up your clubs to curse in a stuffy drawing-room while you play bezique with your dear wife till we go to bed at ten no more betting on podascus james no more whist drives or bridge or any such expensive naughtinesses and how nice it will be for you james to flirt with those earnestly fashionable suburban girls who are just half an hour behind the times and who here jim rent his garments from leah's grasp and departed in haste with an impolite word his wife's humour did not appeal to him in the least and he banged the door unnecessarily hard leah returned to warm her toes and laugh till she cried there was something excessively amusing in the idea of jim setting up for a plaster saint for once in his dull life he displayed a sense of humour and she picked up the discarded novel with a fresh burst of laughter at the picture of the bayswater menage as drawn by her fertile fancy jim as a middle-class philistine tickled her even more than jim in a stained-glass attitude with an artificial halo misfitting his empty head but a remembrance of the cheque payable to jim and of her husband's possible position at the moment telling clumsy truths to an aggrieved father made her serious certainly the duke pleased to hear his son speak honestly for once in a life of consistent fibbing might shed tears over a hastily produced cheque-book jim's falsehoods in times of pressing need were almost inspired and it was not impossible that he might return with the loot then the tradespeople being paid leah decided that she could run up fresh bills to any amount they would be all the more eager to give her unlimited credit when they knew that the duke was in the background decidedly the prospect was not so bad and after all it might be dangerous to make real-life experiments in sensational fiction these common-sense reflections led lady jim to thank the watchful fetish for governing her tongue during the afternoon demetrius could be nasty when he liked she was certain of that and it was just as well to give him no chance some people carried tyranny to a ridiculous excess and liked to hear their victim squeal unmeaningly leah did not belong to the squealing species and vowed a vow that demetrius should never have an opportunity of provoking such feudal outcries as a gleam of good sense warned her of possible danger she decided to avoid the russian or only to flirt sufficiently to make him miserable and jim cross 
having settled the question in this sensible way leah sought her room to dress for the five o'clock muffin scramble she assumed the prettiest tea-gown she possessed for the truly feminine purpose of irritating demetrius into overestimating what he had lost descending like a homeric deity in a cloud of lace she went at once to the library and restored to its place the text-book of her proposed fraud fortunately the room was empty so no one would ever know that the novel had been read with a view to plagiarism not that it mattered much now since jim was proceeding on the lines of honesty is the best policy leah hoped fervently that he would succeed but felt more than a trifle doubtful jim was so new to this straightforward method of gaining his ends the house-party was picnicking in the winter garden a delightful eden where tropical plants flourished in defiance of the season on its glass roof the hail rattled like small shot and through its glass walls could be seen the bleak wintry landscape faintly white in the deepening gloom these glimpses of the unpleasant increased the sense of comfort and over civilized humanity luxuriated in the warm atmosphere as independent of nature's laws as the palm trees under which it ate and drank and talked scandal the frumps nibbled dry toast and sipped milk the fashionables devoured dainty sandwiches and enjoyed the strongest of tea and both aided digestion with chatter and laughter it was the complacent contentment of animals mumbling a plentiful meal and for the moment all spiritual instincts were governed by material needs mrs penworthy's courtiers were feeding their queen who had a large appetite for so small a woman after a full meal she was disposed to be amiable even to freddy had he been there but she became decidedly cross when some of the court deserted her for that woman as she termed lady jim leah was feminine enough to enjoy the fallen expression on mrs penworthy's face and accepted with marked pleasure the attentions of those who crowded round her the sight gave mrs penworthy a fit of indigestion which prevented her enjoying a late dinner it was hard that her vanity had to content itself with the banal compliments of the faithful algy who tried to be a host in himself and was snubbed for his ambition may i present my nephew to you asked lord sargon in his thin precise voice leah intimated that she would be charmed and found herself nodding to a slim dark young man clean-shaven and alert he looked more alive than the languid youths around her and she was not surprised when sargon explained that mr askew was a naval officer who had lately returned from a five years cruise i thought you hadn't been wrapped up in cotton wool all your life said lady jim when sargon had removed the attendant youths and the lieutenant was making himself agreeable in a bluff briny way do i look so uncivilized he asked with laughing eyes highly you are the nearest approach to prehistoric man i have yet seen said she and thus was unjust to jim i am sorry oh there's no need to apologize i dare say circe found ulysses very agreeable homer says so answered askew who appeared to be well read but if i am ulysses you must be circe i accept the compliment is it a compliment asked the prehistoric man daringly unless meant for one it should not have been said beg pardon i'm several kinds of ass but i did mean it civilly you know circe was a clever woman whose magic turned men into outward semblances of their real characters lady jim smiled scornfully and if my magic could transform these she glanced disparagingly round the place what a menagerie it would be pigs and snakes and parrots and dogs of the mongrel kind mr askew do you speak of yourself he nodded laughingly dogs are so devoted 
that means you wish to attach yourself to me said leah gravely i might take you at your word i need a friend but ulysses deserted circe askew laughed and gazed admiringly at her beautiful pensive face we talk parables i think he said with assumed lightness prehistoric man always did i understand on the contrary his speech was direct and blunt mine will be now smiled lady jim this cup has been empty for five minutes and you never offered two the young man took the tiny cup hastily but for the publicity of the place i would ask you to tread upon my prostrate body leah eyed his lithe active figure as he went to the bamboo table presided over by lady frith he was really a delightful sailor man she reflected and quicker than most of his sex to understand the unspoken it might be more amusing to drop demetrius and flirt with him but then his face was too honest and he might object to being made use of men of that kind are so dreadfully in earnest sighed leah with a sense of irritation they think a woman always means what she says askew walked lightly over the mosaic floor with a fresh cup of tea and a plate of hot cakes some man bustled in his way and he stopped to avoid an upset of his burden at the moment he glanced towards the moorish door which admitted triflers into the winter paradise to lady jim's wonderment he started and a look of surprise overspread his expressive face her eyes turned at once in the direction of the entrance and she beheld jim blinking his eyes at the dazzle of light he looked heavy and sullen which hinted that the interview with the duke had not been successful but leah forgot that momentous question for the moment as her quick brain was trying to understand askew's look of surprise before she could ask herself what he could possibly know about jim he approached with the tea this is nice and hot he said placing the plate on the table at her elbow and offering the cup i hope you'll forgive me for neglecting you on one condition replied leah stirring her tea consider it fulfilled was the impetuous answer why did you look surprised when you saw that gentleman at the door leah pointedly suppressed the fact that kames was her husband as if there was anything she would learn it the more easily by pretending that jim was a stranger in fact should ask you learn that the man who had startled him was her lawful lord he might decline to open his lips the lieutenant's next words proved the wisdom of her concealment oh baring he said carelessly well i was surprised to see baring so unexpectedly is his name baring asked lady jim guessing that she was about to learn something connected with jim's very shady past yes i met him in lima lima in peru and that's in south america leah nodded i did learn geography at school she said setting down her empty cup and when askew coloured at the implied snub softened it by asking a friendly question you are surprised at meeting mr er er baring here yes i said so before a nice sort of chap but selfish what a reader of character you are mr askew he looked up eagerly you know him then a little why do you ask the young man stared at the ground and replied in muffled tones i thought you might have met his wife mrs baring of course leah began to laugh the idea that jim might be a bigamist had never struck her before she had guessed that there was a woman connected with those frequent journeys to lima but that jim had adopted the mormon religion was news some women would have been angry but leah had no amatory feelings likely to arouse jealousy so she was frankly amused at her husband's duplicity also she was sorry for mrs baring who perhaps was silly enough to love jim is she a nice woman was her next question she's an angel that means you love her how do you because you are a brick wall i can see through mr askew 
no i have never met mrs baring why did she throw you over and marry mr er baring askew looked quite alarmed i say you are clever he remarked why not you called me circe and i must live up to the name well well echoed askew blankly and their eyes met he coloured no i can't tell you he said quickly for he guessed her desire yes you can and you will rejoined leah composedly jim was bearing the artillery of mrs penworthy's eyes in his usual indifferent way and showed no disposition to seek out his wife probably he would remain for the next hour in the clutches of the little woman who was the limpet to jim's rock this being so leah began to ask questions which askew hesitated to answer we hardly know one another he murmured embarrassed i daren't tell you lady james ah then there's something improper in the matter askew flushed through his bronze skin not at all he said in a brusque tone signorita fajardo is all that is good and holy and pure what bread and butter thought leah wondering if jim had stumbled upon a convent but she was too wise to quote byron to this young man who apparently was simple enough to regard love as something sacred fajardo she repeated a spanish name and a spanish lady he said gloomily lola fajardo of the estancia san iago near rosario i thought you said of lima no i met her there she is in the habit of stopping at lima with her aunt but her true home is at rosario in the santa fe province of the argentine republic i wonder if baring brought her to england she was madly in love with him she must have been to marry him oh baring's a good-looking chap and not bad said askew with the innate chivalry of a man towards a successful rival i suppose they did marry oh then you are not certain no i never even knew if they were engaged but when i joined my ship again at callao every one said marriage they were so uncommonly thick i must ask baring i'm sure he'll be delighted to afford you the information you seek was lady jim's ironical reply have you seen mrs baring asked the young man eagerly no i don't think any mrs baring is stopping here then perhaps he did not marry lola after all cried askew rising hastily and with flashing eyes unless his voice fell she is dead leah yawned really i don't know she replied you had better ask mr baring i see he is passing out of the garden with mrs penworthy in that case i can't spoil sport laughed the lieutenant with an obvious effort but later on later on of course she said rising here comes your uncle lord sargon advanced and with an apologetic look towards leah took askew's arm i wish to present you to lady canby he said the young man looked towards his charmer will you permit me to leave you for a time certainly you will find lady canby delightful and as prehistoric as you can wish we may meet after dinner and with a nod she left the winter garden for the purpose of seeking solitude she wanted to think over jim's iniquities and to consider what use might be made of them for her own benefit lady canvey was delighted to receive askew as she liked handsome young men especially when they were deferential and attentive as this new acquaintance appeared to be though i'm a bad substitute for lady jim she remarked pleasantly lady jim that charming creature with whom you have been talking yes of course lady canvey she is indeed charming but private property her husband is the duke's second son at present in the clutches of that little harpy mrs penworthy don't you make love to lady jim or you'll burn your fingers i mistrust red-haired women myself but she and jim match each other capitally their marriage was made in heaven and lady canvey chuckled 
is her husband here asked askew looking round anxious to see who owned circe of the many wiles no he went out with mrs penworthy a quarter of an hour ago askew remembered how lady jim had drawn his attention to an outgoing couple didn't the lady go out with a mr baring he gasped no with lord jim kaimes and she his wife the lady i askew stopped with a groan try an unmarried woman advised lady canvey misunderstanding his emotion it's more proper and less expensive End of chapter 8chapter nine of lady jim of curzon street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lady jim of curzon street by fergus hume chapter nine keeping up the necessary darby and joan comedy kames strolled into his wife's dressing-room half an hour before dinner to inquire if she was ready leah had a second-hand view of him in a full-length mirror before which she posed while her maid added a few final touches to an eminently successful frock from the composed expression of his face she guessed that he had not yet renewed his acquaintance with mr askew and therefore must be ignorant that the free-spoken sailor had let the cat out of the bag lady jim possessed the animal now but she did not intend to reveal her capture until jim explained how he had sped with the duke a slight nod towards the glass showed her husband that she was aware of his presence and the maid continued to use experienced fingers but leah looked so charming that further trouble in this way was like adding sugar to honey jim stared approvingly and when the maid was dismissed she saw his way to a compliment you have the good points of several women rolled into one leah he said with the look of a sultan appraising an odalisque that polite speech means much coming from a man of your experience my dear jim what good point of mrs penworthy's have i annexed you're jealous horribly you are so deeply attached to that bundle of faded chiffon i don't care two straws for her appearances are misleading then but added leah remembering askew's eulogy it may be that you prefer something that's good and holy and pure i don't know why you should say that grumbled jim annoyed at being credited with such primitive tastes you may know before long and she laughed at the thought of the marine bombshell which would shortly shatter jim's complacency i don't know what you're talking about said kames with unaffected surprise and i'm confoundedly hungry ah did the duke's lecture give you an appetite leah jim became so serious as to look almost intelligent my father is the best man who ever wore shoe leather he is usually condemned to cloth boots for gouty feet murmured leah patting the back of her head so you've pulled the wool over his eyes again i wish you wouldn't use slang protested jim virtuously i can't pretend to vie with mrs penworthy's purity of speech my dear man how much have you got out of the duke well he hasn't given me money oh but he's promised ah i wish you'd let me speak cried kames testily my father has promised to pay all the debts good heavens is he aware of the amount wait i've not finished he'll pay the debts and reduce our income to a thousand a year till he recoups himself really i thought you had seen your father and not a money-lender have you accepted this most generous offer yes i have 
said Jim sulkily, and kicking a mat out of the way. "'I see it's to be Bayswater after all, James.' "'If you talk like that, I'll go down to dinner without you.' "'By all means, you've taken away my appetite.' she laughed in a way calculated to still further infuriate jim who paced the room in a towering passion nevertheless she was seriously angry had the duke refused all help it would have been more decent but this bargain which was all on one side annoyed her beyond measure what did the duke mean by taking their money it seems to me we've got to pay our own debts then she said while jim seethed like a whirlpool and why shouldn't we it's only fair leah stared and began to think that jim was too good for this world i hope you are not going to die she said anxiously not in your way cried kaimes misunderstanding her we aren't going to have any burying alive or substituted corpses and i'm going to hang on as a respectable member of society i'll come and hear you preach jim i'm preaching now raged her husband and don't you make any mistake leah i've told the duke everything how injudicious he might have had a fit he didn't even blame me said jim breaking down and there were tears in his eyes leah laughed amazingly long and loud considering the tightness of her corset i wish i had been present did you cry too jim i jolly well nearly did said kaimes truthfully if ungrammatically though it's no good explainin to an icicle like you but the pater's goin to pay the debts free our income and let the curzon street house better and better than we do go to bayswater he'll allow us one thousand a year till the debts are wiped off went on kaimes hurriedly and wishing to get the explanation over and we can go abroad for a couple of years you can i shan't as my wife you must as an individual i shan't retorted lady jim calmly she was getting over her rage now as she foresaw a very different interview between herself and jim before they retired for the night it is very good of you to have settled all this without consulting me and now that you have done so let us go to dinner but i there's the gong observed leah opening the door and i don't like cold soup you'll have to like lots of things now you didn't like before said jim as they went down the selection doesn't include you my good man so don't be disappointed jim could have shaken her and began to understand why the lower orders indulged in wife-beating but as they were entering the drawing-room at this moment he had to play the part of a devoted husband leah floated radiantly into the brilliantly lighted apartment and jim sought out the oldest and ugliest woman he could find when he thought of his wife beauty sickened him for the time being thus it came about that miss jaffrey had the pleasure of shouting into his ear throughout a long and wearisome dinner whether it was the work of the fetish or of lady frith leah did not know but she found herself seated at the table with askew on her right hand the young man looked flustered and ill at ease i'm so sorry he began apologetically and as she thought tactlessly that you're my neighbour she interrupted sweetly how unkind no but i never knew he was your husband who mr baring don't make it harder for me he entreated softly i've been calling myself names ever since we parted you should have left that to me mr askew there's nothing in it you know he stuttered heedlessly of course she never married him 
"I hope not, for the sake of morality," said Lady Jim, lightly, and thinking that the soup was worse than usual. "However, it doesn't matter. My husband is a modest man, and sometimes drops his title when travelling. I dare say, as Mr. Berring, he thought he was free to make love." but he wasn't protested askew with a glance towards the unconscious jim who apparently had not recognised him you should tell him so i intend to in the smoking-room lady jim looked at him imperiously and softened her voice to a very direct whisper don't make trouble she said in a somewhat domineering tone that will do no good and much harm and after all married or unmarried every man has a right to admire a pretty woman but not to make love to her muttered the young man with another vengeful glance i am no casuist replied leah calmly and you should be pleased that things are as they are you can now return to lima or rosario and marry the lady she wouldn't have me is she so much in love with mr berring then please don't lady james i can't talk like this to you she gave a light laugh it seems to me that you are talking therefore i repeat my question it might only have been gratitude he murmured for what berring i mean your husband saved her from being trampled upon by a mustang how picturesque and how suited to jim's qualifications and she no she didn't interrupted askew hurriedly i see i have been mistaken it was gratitude not love of course said lady jim jeeringly a woman always prefers to exercise the former rather than the latter i wish i'd stopped and tried my luck muttered the sailor not clever enough to interpret the speech it's not too late mr berring is safely secured by love and the law to my apron string so you can go back and no i've just come in for a property of sorts and the service has seen the last of me is signorita fajardo in the same predicament as the service there's a cousin lady james a female cousin who goes with the property as a fixture i quite understand you have to marry her out of gratitude for the money and without the discomforting passion of love the spanish lady's history repeats itself i see askew was rather discomfited how quick you are you can't have had much to do with women she murmured but i hope you will make no trouble in the smoking-room no as things are it's none of my funeral he observed grumpily quite so i am the chief mourner but i say lady james said the lieutenant anxiously i hope what i've inadvertently told you won't of course not she assured him mendaciously my husband is most trustworthy as you can see by his choice of that ugly old maid as a dinner companion you were mistaken i think i must have been said askew with great relief of course people talk at lima as elsewhere he ended apologetically unless south america is inhabited by the deaf and dumb i suppose they do you're laughing at me lady james i always laugh it's good for the digestion at everything at everything even at love he asked timidly she shot an amused glance at his colouring face remember you are engaged to the fixture mr askew but i say can't i come and see you in town i shall be delighted if you can find your way to curzon street you live there he asked obtusely in a most respectable manner with my husband mr berring i'm known as lady jim of curzon street most improper isn't it when berring i say don't expostulated the young man quickly i'll never forgive myself for being such a fool can i call you lady jim he was getting on very fast and leah in the interests of virtue deemed it necessary to snub him certainly not only people who have known me fifty years address me so familiarly you must believe in reincarnation then he retorted this was clever and pleased her 
i was circe in the days of homer mr askew but as to my name now there is another lady jim a horrid woman who carries tracts and meddles with morals and dresses in a piously shabby fashion so that we may not be mixed up i am known by the name of the street i live in to you i am lady james kames and circe the sorceress he murmured leah laughed we'll see what sort of animal my magic will turn you into she observed with an encouraging smile this was a distinct promise or at least he construed it as such for his eyes brightened and he glanced at her in a way which assured her that she was looking her best he was certainly a delightful boy she reflected if somewhat fickle but a man who was catholic enough to marry the fixture and adore the spanish lady and make sudden love to herself must be worth feminine appreciation and study besides he was good-looking and had money conjoined with a frank and unsuspicious nature assuredly he might be useful if not inclined to explore the land of tenderness too assiduously but in that case he might compromise her in an earnest pig-headed way which would be at once boring ridiculous and dangerous leah approved of playing with fire but she was too careful to risk a personal conflagration though allured by the prospect of tormenting an honest heart she had not made up her mind to enjoy the opportunity by the time she left the dining-room but a distinctly tigerish glance sent to her address by demetrius almost inclined her to give young askew the chance of making a fool of himself the russian had apparently noticed the embryo flirtation all the better thought leah sailing into the adamless eden of the winter garden it will be an additional card to play which showed that lady jim was by no means satisfied with the arrangement come to between her husband and his father a cigarette dear lady jim simpered mrs penworthy no thanks i leave smoking to women who bait their hooks with agreeable vices and she moved towards lady canvey it was horribly rude and mrs penworthy choked back an hysterical scream delightful woman lady james said miss jaffrey delightful assented the other who at the moment would gladly have mounted the scaffold on a charge of murdering her insolent rival i call her perfectly lovely such a perfect complexion and exquisite figure and heavenly eyes and large hands but this piece of spite was wasted as by this time lady jim was seated by her godmother assuring that sceptical lady how absolutely delighted she was to learn that dear jim had arranged matters with the dear duke and so sweet of the duke to tell you she went on i know how anxious you have been about me can you wonder at it, my dear when you are so sweet and gentle and womanly said lady canby who was quite equal to a war of words you must be thinking of hilda frith replied lady jim calmly i cannot call myself such an angel no you left that to the sailor boy you were flirting with poor boy he doesn't know how to flirt you'll teach him my dear chuckled the old lady not without fees hum his education will cost him a pretty penny possibly but i might teach him for love after the fashion of miss tallentire and lionel rubbish joan doesn't know how to flirt or to dress either i must ask her how the whiteley sails are getting on leah said lady canby with a pained look why have you such a bitter tongue i must defend myself somehow you wouldn't have me scratch and bite would you i would have you be more womanly and lovable my dear on a thousand a year and such a husband as i have every man is what his wife makes him they generally go to other men's wives to be manufactured besides so far as jim is concerned you can't make a silk purse out of a certain 
animal's ear my dear i am an old woman and perhaps rather sharp-tongued at times but i have a motherly feeling for you can't you give up this wild life and go abroad to devote yourself to jim he has his good points my dear and if you would try and live more amicably with him i am sure you would be a happy woman then in a year or so you could come back to curzon street with all the debts paid and your full income to live on believe me she laid a withered hand on leah's beautiful arm i speak for the best my dear girl leah smiled disdainfully now that the sermon's over can i pass round the plate she said cruelly not for me to put money in said lady canvey with a flush i shan't give you a penny it is useless talking to you leah your one idea is money and enjoyment and love of admiration it seems to me that those are three ideas replied lady jim rising but as our conversation is neither enjoyable nor instructive i shall go away all the same she lingered and talked in a low tone with unexpected emotion you blame me lady canvey for being what i am pray what chance have i had of being otherwise i lost my mother when i was a child i was brought up by a neglectful and selfish father i am married to a husband who has nothing of the man about him save those handsome looks which lured me into a much regretted marriage all my life i have lived with worldly and material people and your counsel has been as worldly as that of any one of them i have never been shown the difference between right and wrong and there isn't a single soul in the world who has a spark of love for me if my upbringing and surroundings had been better i might be a good woman so far as i can be i am a good woman i have my moments of regret i have my moments when i wish i could be a religious dowdy saint but who will help me out of the mire who will here she broke off for her emotion was becoming too strong for the publicity of the place with a violent effort which showed the strength and courage of her nature she calmed down and the colour faded from her face as did the frown which gave place to a cynical smile annoyed with herself for having given lady canvey a glimpse of her better nature she walked away leaving the old woman surprised and startled and in her own selfish way truly sorry there was much truth in what leah had said but her mask was on again the moment she crossed to the door and demetrius who was obviously looking for her saw only the beautiful calm woman he knew so well his face was as agitated as leah's had been a few minutes previously madame i must see you privately what an extraordinary request monsieur ah but you will understand he threw out his hands expressively no i am ignorant of the deaf and dumb language cruel cruel silly silly she mocked then glanced round with upraised eyebrows don't make a scene monsieur or i shall begin to believe that you appreciate our english custom of lingering over the wine will you let me explain entreated the russian certainly to-morrow at four i'll be in the picture gallery good-night and with a friendly nod she moved away demetrius swore softly in russian which is a most picturesque language in many ways without a glance lady jim ascended the stairs well pleased demetrius was losing command of himself and therefore would be all the easier to manage should she require his services 
i'll have that twenty thousand before spring she decided End of chapter nine